Hey, this is Connor. And this is Zach. We're from Biker's Edge, and today we're doing the roundup for the Value E-Bike Showdown. Oh! Oh, oh giant rock! Sabotage! Really quick reminder, if you haven't already watched the individual videos, go watch those first. Come back here, because this is not a review of each one. We're just gonna summarize, compare, and contrast. The four bikes we have are the Giant Stance E plus one, the Giant Rain E plus three, the Rocky Mountain Instinct Power Play A50, and the Orbea Rise H30. That was a lot of numbers. That's so many numbers. <laughs> So obviously when you get into an e-bike, one of the most important things is going to be the drive system, which includes the motor, the battery, everything that it takes to run that. And for me, a drive system needs to do three things well to get a win in my book. And that's, it needs to give you enough power. It needs to deliver that power smoothly and naturally, and it needs to last. The battery needs to have decent range. So for me, the Rocky Mountain Instinct takes the win in two of those three categories. It First of all, it has the most power with 108 Newton meters. And then I think it delivers that power the smoothest. It's the most natural and it matches your effort that you're putting into the bike the best. Yeah, I would agree that that motor really does a good job as you put more in, it matches and increases more very proportionally. Not all motors work that way. Some of them, they're just gonna put in the amount of power they're gonna put in, um, whether you're putting in 50 watts yourself or 200 watts yourself, they're still just putting in that amount of power. The one on the Rocky Mountain does a great job of just matching yours and increasing as you put more in. So the Dynamy ends up overall being my favorite drive system out of all the e-bikes. It can be a little fickle at times. It tends to have weird little glitches more often than some of the others. I think a lot of it stems from sitting down on the bike when you turn it on. Because yes. of that high pulley, I think as you sag into the bike, it pulls on that so the motor doesn't calibrate itself right at startup. Yes. So either starting off of the bike when you turn it on or calibrating the bike will fix a lot of these or avoid a lot of these potential problems. A couple things that you really got to keep in mind is when you turn that on, you cannot have weight on the suspension. With the way their system works, it just has to be zeroed out when you turn it on. And really probably best practice on all of these is make sure you just you're not on the bike, you turn them on, you wait the three or four seconds for them to calibrate and load, and you're gonna be good to go from there. Next up in drive systems is the Rain. I think that Sync Drive Pro is, it's almost, almost as good as the Dynamy. It doesn't give you quite as much power. It is every bit as smooth, I'd say, and quieter. It is the quietest of all the e-bike motors I've ridden. For me, I'm actually going to probably put the Sync Drive Pro just a little over the Dynamy. I feel like, the extra power on the Dynamy is fun. I mean, 108 Newton meters, it's a lot of power. It's pretty cool. But I don't feel like you can really use it most of the time. And when you do, it is going to suck the battery down. I like the Sync Drive Pro a little bit more. I like the smoothness. I like how absolutely not finicky that motor is. Um, I like the quietness. And uh, I think it just has a really nice range, you know, of where that power comes on. Some of the motors you'll find come on really early, some motors come on later. I just felt like that gave me the most consistent power throughout the entire race. That is a good point. It does deliver that power very well. And it's, it's somewhere between the Dynamy and the Shimano EP8. Mm -hmm. Shimano EP8 is kind of like on off, Dynamy ramps like a dimmer switch. The Sync Drive Pro lands somewhere in the middle of that with that power delivery. It is really nice, but I kind of like the extra power. <laughs> One thing about the Sync Drive Pro is it does have an automatic mode that just yeah. never worked for me. It, it, it's nice and it's supposed to match the effort you're putting into the bike, but it was too slow to respond to changes in input. So you come up to a steep ledge and you give it some extra power and the motor doesn't quite kick in until you're already past that ledge or already fell over because you couldn't make it up. It. So next up we have the Stance, which is basically the same as the Rain E, but it's the Sync Drive Sport instead of the Pro. So it does get a little bit less power. And it's a little bigger too, but I don't know how much that really matters in the end of the day. Yeah, it's a little bigger, a little bit clunkier, kind of that whole bike is that way anyway, <laughs> but I didn't really miss the extra 15 Newton meters. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really feel the difference between 85 and, and 70. So for me, the motor on the Stance E is great. Yeah, I mean, it's, it goes back to that question. 
how much power do you really need? Is 70 Newton meters enough? I think for most trail conditions, it probably is. And that leads right into the Orbea Rise because that bike has the least power on offer. It only brings 60 Newton meters to the table with that throttled back Shimano EP8. Because of that though, I think it does offer the most natural feeling ride experience out of all of the e-bikes. Don't even know that it's really close. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely, there's e-bikes, which feel and ride like e-bikes, two different variations. There's regular bikes, but then the Rise does, to me, kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So one thing to really keep in mind with the Rise 2 is there are two profiles that they have set up in it. Uh, profile 1 comes stock with 48 Newton meters of power. Profile 2 is 60 Newton meters. And if you have a Rise, just for the love of everything, just go to Profile 2. It's an e-bike. Use it. It's an e-bike. Have the power there if you need it. You always have trail setting at a lower power if that's what you need. And because the Rise uses a little bit less power, it is a bit more efficient with its battery. So even though it only has a 540 watt hour battery, you do get more out of that than you would on a full power bike. So for me, I would say it probably has the best range in the group. So what the Rise really does well is use that power efficiently and effectively to get you up the hill. So climbing presents a bit of a unique challenge on an e-bike. It's not as much about pure efficiency or lack of pedal bob. It's more about geometry, body position, and traction generated by the suspension design. The additional power from the motor will really compound any problems from bad geometry or bad suspension mm -hmm. design. For example, if your body position is too far off the back of the bike, say from a slack seat tube angle, that front end's gonna get really light, really wandery, and going to be tough to manage. On the other side, if you are too far forward or the suspension doesn't generate any traction, the back wheel's just gonna slip and all that extra power does absolutely nothing for you. So starting out with the Giant Rain, on paper it's the biggest, burliest, nastiest bike, but it actually is one of the better climbers in the test. For me, it all comes down to that suspension design. Because that back wheel is completely glued to the ground, you have tons and tons of traction. So you can get up and over nasty root balls and ledges and rocks with really no problem at all. Yeah, you're not really riding this climbing with finesse. You're riding this climbing kind of like you're descending. You point, you put some power down, and you're gonna get up over it. That traction's just gonna keep that wheel digging, and you're gonna go. So next up is the instinct. And for me, it's not only the gobs and gobs of power that it has that makes it a good climber, it's that it is a very balanced bike. I think it has probably the best climbing position, the yeah. best center point or balance point between the two wheels. I found on this, I actually wasn't using the highest power in, while I was climbing. Because you don't like having fun? <sighs> you know, at some point when it becomes really techy, you get enough power going in there that you just can't use it. And so backing it off like one step down or so really gave it a nice feel and I was able to pick lines better. But yes, this bike again is just really balanced climbing and I'd agree, probably the best overall climbing position that UE got out of the test. And next up is your Bay Rise. And that is the most like your pedal bike, not only in terms of the amount of power it offers, but in terms of the handling and the suspension quality of the bike. It feels like you're riding your normal little pedal bike. Mm -hmm. And that's really advantageous in tight trails, slow speed corners, slow speed trails. It, it gives you that maneuverability and that agility that you need to ride those kinds of trails. One thing though to keep in mind on the Rise is it wants you to spin. That programming that Orbea did with that RS tune on that EP8 is different than a regular EP8. It wants you to spin. They did that for efficiency. They did that to also give it a very regular bike, non-e-bike feel. While different, it works very, very well. And lastly, the stance. I struggled a little bit with this bike because of the geometry and I think a little bit the suspension design. The seat tube angle is pretty slack and that pulls your weight further back mm -hmm. and that front end is pretty hard to control. And because of the suspension design, I think that compounds that problem even more because it doesn't hold you up very well. You tend to bounce and bob a little bit, mm -hmm. which makes that front end even lighter. So I, I struggled on some of the more technical bits of, of our climbs on this bike. When we switched over, I even tried moving the saddle all the way forward uh, in an attempt to get my weight a little bit better over the front of the bike. And while maybe it helped a little bit, I just never could feel like I got that really good climbing position where I could get down the front end kind of wanted to wander on me and uh, I just had a hard time getting up some of the lines that I don't think should have been as hard as they were feeling. 
Yeah, I mean, I almost endowed going uphill on a mountain bike, and I've never done that before. So I, I think this one was a little tough to control in the rough, rudy bits. Yep. So now we get to descending, and it's tough to pick a best descender, especially with such a broad group of bikes here. We've got short travel, long travel, and everything in between. But each bike brings something unique to the table. And starting with the Giant Rain, that bike brings all of the smash to the table. <laughs> that bike is big, it's burly, it's long, low. It just plows through and over everything like it wasn't even there. It's fun because you are taking really a very kind of specific riding technique in order to go downhill fast on this. And it is point and shoot. It will mow over just about anything your way. If you're the type of rider who's looking for something that's like nimble and changing direction and you're just scooting all over the trail, that's not it. If you just point and shoot, you are gonna have the biggest grin on your face. We talk about fun bikes a lot in terms of them being easy to jump and easy to change lines and unweight and things, but this bike is fun in its own right and the fact that you can just go like 100 everywhere. And then the Instinct. That bike is the most all-mountain to me. It's the most do-it-all, go-everywhere bike in this test. It handles the easier terrain much better than the rain, and it handles rough terrain better than the rise in the stance. Mm -hmm. It just is that jack-of-all-trades bike. Yeah, again, balance is going to be the key word here. Uh, I was surprised that it was really fairly easy to change direction in, and I found myself kind of popping off some stuff uh, that maybe I wasn't on the rain, um, but a little bit more confident than it was on the rise. And so I just really think it does a great job of allowing you to ride a huge range of trail. And again, on the descents, the rise feels the most like your pedal bike. It offers the most lively, most engaging, responsive ride quality of all of these bikes. It's not only lighter, which makes a huge difference. You know, it's 10-ish yeah. pounds lighter than some of the heavier bikes in this test. And that goes a long way in making this bike easier to ride. Well, you can come up on a rock and maybe you're not going to bash through it like you would like the rain, but you're, you can so easily just pull up, hop right over it. You can change directions so easily. And it really, especially after riding it for a few minutes, you start forgetting that it's an e-bike while you're descending. The other bikes, while incredibly fun, are pretty impossible to forget that you're on an e-bike while you're descending. Yeah. And then the stance again was a little tricky for me. It kind of has that more old school geometry to it where it's got a steeper front end and it doesn't have as long of a reach. It's not as stable and it doesn't give you the confidence that some of these other bikes do. That said, it did better than I thought it would for it, being a little 120 mil bike, for having kind of some steeper head tube. It actually did okay. And that might come down to the fact that a 120 mil e-bike maybe rides a bit more like a 140 mil pedal bike. It wasn't quite on the same level as the other ones, but it, like Connor said, it was fun. It was definitely more capable than I thought it was going to be. Like I was actually, we were riding some fairly technical trails. I was a little bit nervous to start descending on that thing, especially after riding the other bikes that we had ridden. It was fun. Uh, part of me wonders if we were to maybe shorten the stem, put a little bit wider bar on, make a couple tweaks if that bike does become a better descender overall. Uh, as it sits though, it's fun. It's a fun blues and greens. I'm not taking it on blacks. Agreed. Except you did. Except we did. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we get into the value because this is the value e-bike showdown. So which bike offers the most bang for your buck? And for me, I don't think you can beat the giant rain. For me, you need to hit a certain threshold with the quality of your components where they do their job, they do it well, and for a long time, they don't break on you. And the rain does all of that with everything. The drivetrain's good, the brakes are good, the suspension is surprisingly good. Tire selection was perfect. Yeah. So it really hit the mark on every component. And when you combine that with the great motor, I think it's just the best value out of all these bikes. Yeah, you know, if we had one little complaint on it, I mean, we're riding an extra large and the dropper post really is a little shorter than what probably needs to be on an extra large. But, you know, all things considered, that's a pretty small complaint. As great a value as the rain is, I think the rise is so close to the value that you get out of the rain. Pretty much every piece of componentry that comes on that bike belongs on the bike. If we had a couple little things that we'd maybe change, you know, maybe a four piston brake instead of the two piston brakes could help give you just a little bit better stopping power. Although I will say, I don't know that 
the two piston brakes really threw me off all that much. Yeah, as a rule, I don't want them on an e-bike, and Fair. it bothered me. Yeah, uh, but for only two hundred dollars more than the Rain, I think you're getting, you know, ballpark same value as the Rain. Oh, absolutely. And the Rocky Mountain Instinct, it is by far the most expensive bike in our test. You know, it's roughly a thousand dollars more than the closest bike, but you're definitely not getting a thousand dollars more worth of mm. value in your components. Where I think you get the value is in the motor and in other intangibles, like how versatile the bike is yeah. and how good of an all-arounder it is. Well, and you also get that great big battery. That's gonna cost more. Full disclosure, we really were hoping to get the A30 in the test. It didn't work out. Uh, when we look at that, you know, being roughly the same price range as the other bikes, the value though on the parts really would be a little bit of a notch below. Uh, I'd say closer to the stance value. And then it's a little bit funny, but the worst value bike in the whole test for me is also the cheapest. Uh, that stance just isn't on the same level as these other bikes in terms of components, frame design, suspension design. It's just not quite there. And considering it's only an extra 550 bucks to get into that rain or rise level bike, for me it's worth every penny or every month I have to wait saving to get that next level bike. Absolutely, and this might sound like an exaggeration, it's not. That $550 to me feels like almost twice the bike. Easily. Like when you really are looking at performance, rideability, just how aggressive you can get on the bike if you want to, it's just a huge, huge difference. It's worth every penny in my book. So really quickly, just to wrap this up, we're gonna talk about who each bike is for to help you find the right one for you. So starting with that giant rain, it's no surprise that this is for the person who lives for the descents. They want steep, rough, fast, jumps, drops, all the fun mm -hmm. stuff. And they want to do it multiple times. So it's your self shuttle downhill or enduro bike. Yeah. Instead of having to get a bunch of buddies and somebody's always driving the truck up and down, get a bunch of buddies on reins and everybody's riding the whole time. And then for me, the instinct is for that do it all rider. Uh, just like the bike is a jack of all trades. It is for the jack of all trades rider. They want to go do a big XC ish ride. They want to go ride some rugged stuff. It will do all of that and never feel out of place. And with a lot of power to spare. Yeah, if you like power, <laughs> if you like dirt bikes, this is the one for you. All right, so who the rise is for? I would say the rise is for the guy who is a little hesitant on the e-bike thing, intrigued, doesn't want to go full big bike because it's a motorcycle or whatever. None of these are motorcycles. But wants to kind of take that first step in. It does an amazing job at it. You know, the rise to me is can be that one bike that you always ride you know it kind of doesn't matter there's really not a bad day for a rise or a bad trail for a rise you know whereas we look at some of the other bikes a uh, pretty good chance if you have a rain you're also going to want a regular non-e-bike that you're going to ride on certain terrain and certain days you know this rise really just covers everything pretty darn well yeah, I, I almost like to think of it as the gateway e-bike, but I don't think that gives it enough credit because mm -hmm. it it's more than just that. I, I've ridden a ton of e-bikes and I still really enjoy riding the Rise for the ride quality that it brings to the table. And last up, the Stance I see as a good option for the more casual rider. Someone who's not looking to push their boundaries or to progress wildly in the sport. They're maybe looking to go ride on the weekends with their kids or go ride at the park, ride a rail trail, ride around the neighborhood, but they want a full suspension mountain bike for it. I think it's a very good bike for that. And I, I will say it is a mountain bike that you could ride on blues and greens. And I mean, mm -hmm. we rode it on some black diamond terrain and survived. It's just not ideal or maybe designed with that in mind. You know, I look at the stance as the bike for somebody who's maybe considering a hybrid maybe considering something more mellow, but you know, wants the versatility of having the full suspension, wants the comfort of full suspension, even if a lot of your riding is gonna be done on the road or dirt roads and stuff like that. I really think that's where that bike's gonna excel. All right, so there you have it. This is the Value e-bike showdown. If you want help finding any of these bikes, please send us an email, give us a call. I'm more than happy to help you find one. So thanks for sticking around. See you next time.